Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. It is my uh, pleasure to welcome uh, you all. It seems like it was forever since we were gathered together, at least in this room. Um, we have a uh, so uh, thank you for being here. We will continue to abide by whatever COVID regulations exist, uh, even if they're changing by the minute. But we are, uh, as I'm being told, fully on camera in every direction. And um, we have a hybrid going now. So with that, I'm happy to call our meeting to order. And if you would please, Jeffra, call the roll and uh, get started. Certainly. Bishop Michael Badger. Here. Bishop Michael Badger. Ronald Bennett. Mr. Bennett. Mr. Bennett is connected. I can see him on my screen. Okay. Present. Reverend Mark Blue. Here. Ronald Chapin. Here. Jonathan Dandies. Yes. Darby Fishkin. Here. Sharon Hansen. Here. Dr. Kathleen Grimm. Here. Michael Hopper. Here. Christian Johnson. Here. James Lewicki. Christopher O'Brien. Here. Jennifer Persico. Here. Jack Quinn. Eugenio Russo. Here. Percy, sorry. Michael Seaman. <laughs> Benjamin Swanacamp. Here. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. So we have a quorum. Yes, yes sir, we do. Thank you. Let the record reflect that. I also want to begin our meeting by welcoming, uh, we have two brand new board members, um, Christian Johnson. Christian, thank you for being here and your appointment. And uh, as well as Ben Swanekamp. Uh, ben, I think you're here on at least uh, virtually. Thank you for joining our board. And this is the first actual meeting for Reverend Blue. So Reverend Blue, welcome. And uh, once again, thank you for your, for your presence here today. We'll uh, go immediately to the uh, approval of the minutes, and unless there are deletions or uh, additions or corrections to it, uh, we'll proceed to an immediate vote. All in favor of approving the minutes as presented, please signify by saying aye. 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 I've learned that after all these months. <laughs> we have to wait for <laughs> virtual stuff. It's like a 30 second delay. Now, I oppose. None the motion carries. Um, resolutions. Sure. So Finance Committee met last week, um, Tuesday, and we reviewed management's proposals that they received for a capital working line of credit. And the Finance Committee recommends that they move forward with the bank that had the most favorable terms. Second. Second by Sharon Hansen. Further discussion? John, you want to comment? <clears throat> sure. Um, you know, this is something that we felt was necessary, uh, especially given last year, um, you know, working capital line of credit, which ECMC does not have, is one that makes a lot of sense. Uh, we were able to get several proposals. The one that's being proposed for a $10 million line of credit unsecured uh, for a year with an option to renew, with an option to potentially increase depending upon performance. So uh, it really made a lot of sense, makes a lot of sense now. Uh, and for us, certainly we'd like it larger, but given the circumstances, I think the bank that, that we're selecting or proposing to select really did come through in this, in this time for us. And um, it's really good terms, what we wanted, and um, happy to answer any questions. Questions for John? Comments? If there are none, we'll come immediately to a vote. All in favor of the motion as presented, we signify by saying aye. 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 And the contrary. That motion carries. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Darby. Uh, and thank you, Mike Seaman in absentia. Um, Dr. Cummings, medical report, medical debt report. Thank you, Mr. Dandies. Um, before you is, uh, for your review, is the uh, MedExec uh, minutes from June's meeting, which was held yesterday, um, includes uh, the credentials committee with one extraction um, of just uh, um, 
a staff member who needs to get something else in their file. So nothing of any uh, um, particular interest for discussion. And then as well, a policy uh, for ethics, which is just a language change and, and no substantial changes. And that's all I have today. Thank you, Dr. Cummings. Are there any questions for Dr. Cummings? Well, here's the May. Is there a second? A second. Dr. Grimm, further conversation, discussion, comment? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 As opposed, that motion carries as well. Thank you. Dr. Murray. Yes, um, this month, Dr. Paul Hosking, who was our chief of laboratory medicine, uh, resigned from UB Pathology to pursue other opportunities, uh, meaning we had to fill that position after consultation with Dr. Tomaszewski. I'm pleased uh, to uh, request uh, to the board uh, the appointment as chief of laboratory medicine of Dr. Keith Crable. Uh, he's also a member of UB Pathology. He's an experienced clinical pathologist who's been with, with UB since 1996. He's actually uh, overseen the blood transfusion service for Kaleida Health. Uh, so he's very experienced in blood banking. Uh, he's also been very active locally in the Erie County Medical Society. That's the only change to the uh, uh, attached list of chiefs of service is the appointment of Dr. Craig. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Just a quick question. Is that a, a, a triple appointment? I mean, he's appointed here as well as the medical school and a Kaleida? Uh, yes, uh, you know, many physicians have uh, multiple appointments, including myself. Okay. But none of them as great as you are. <laughs> we can all that's, aspire. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, well, some approach that. <laughs> Dr. Cummins. Uh, anyway, motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Second, uh, Mr. Lucieri, uh, for the comments. All in, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And to the contrary. That motion carries as well. Dr. Quattrochi. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, as you know, I usually stand, but so if you see me, I will stay seated. Um, can you bring it up, Adrian? Testing on the stop. Here we go. All righty. I'll put the slides one more. Here we go. So um, just to keep everybody updated as to where we are with our COVID patients, uh, we've treated 1,290 COVID patients today. Uh, as you can see, our length of stay uh, continues uh, to be very good uh, considering how sick uh, some of these patients are. Um, you'll see we have 13 COVID patients in house. Uh, that does not represent uh, those patients who had uh, COVID uh, and you know, consequently um, tested negative and are still in the building needing the ICU or something like that. So uh, again, we were continuing to see uh, COVID patients for long periods of time uh, and trying to place uh, them in the community, uh, whether that be a nursing home situation or others, uh, but it's, it's, it tends to be very difficult to place uh, some patients. So as you know, our patient population has many uh, social issues. Uh, so we're continuing to, to see some COVID patients. Good news is, uh, we've gone down significantly. Uh, we're very proud that we have uh, almost 87% of our staff vaccinated uh, here at ECMC. So just kudos to the staff and uh, to Andy and the entire team who really have, have <coughs> pushed for that. Uh, and also uh, the staff that actually did the vaccination has done an unbelievable job. Uh, this is the amount of vaccinations we've given um, in East, at ECMC and in the community. As we know, we've done several pop-up uh, sites all across the community. And again, the team here has just done a phenomenal job uh, staffing those and keeping all those organized. Um, under quality, uh, this month, I'm gonna have Charlene uh, talk about the Quality and Safety Institute that we, uh, what we, we put together with Kaleida uh, and the university. And she's just gonna cover uh, a couple slides here to, to let the board know about this initiative. Go ahead, Charlene. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So the Quality and Patient Safety Institute that's being developed by Great Lakes Health has, um, the slide you see there actually has a typo in it, it's just YouTube, there should be no dot in that. But if you have a chance, you know, look at that uh, YouTube because basically um, there are two different 
sections that are being covered in that YouTube that talks to us about where we are in healthcare with healthcare quality. Many years ago, the To Air as Human was a piece that was uh, awakening to people about the quality of healthcare. And Dr. And, uh, Don Berwick, who is the leader of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, back in December of 2021, or 2020, I'm sorry, um, he put out this YouTube that talks about where are we 20 years later? And do we still have a chasm that we need to be looking at? So it also he comments on the roadmap to advance patient safety in ambulatory care. So the Quality and Patient Safety Institute that we're developing is really looking at crossing the quality chasm because we want to make sure that healthcare um, for all of our patients is safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, and equitable. So with that, I'll go to the next slide. The Quality and Patient Safety Institute, our mission is to drive excellence in quality and safety across Great Lakes Health. So again, this includes the colitis sites, but it's not just the inpatient, not just the hospitals. It includes ECMC, all of our clinics. It includes UB, and we're all working together to make sure that we have the vision to be the leaders in equitable care, delivery of health care, and wellness. And we're putting a big emphasis on wellness. And I think COVID has really helped us look at um, and appreciate Eight. our values Eight. identified, which include respect of all respect all regardless of workplace uh, while holding ourselves accountable to improving oneself our team members and the institution um, and the community so again we're working together to really improve the quality of patient but being very patient centered and looking across the continuum of care for patients next slide please so this, you know, to kind of summarize this, it, this is a big undertaking. It includes, like I said, all these different groups. But with Great Lakes Integrated Systems, we want this Patient Safety Institute to have several divisions, which are really going to look at what best practices are and also give us a very um, a great focus on quality for every level of care that we provide. So there is a division that's looking at our data and regulatory reporting. And that group is gonna be our uh, best practices for analytics, for prediction modeling, forecasting, and then event reporting. And we're trying to look at best practices there. And that is being led by Dr. Winkelstein along with um, Kathy Murray at Kaleida. And then in, under accreditation, of course, we have DNB and Joint Commission, and we have leaders that are gonna be uh, helping us look at doing our own mock surveys, doing accreditation management, um, so they will all be working together so that as we do some of our surveys, we use a lot of our internal resources instead of having to venture out um, hiring consultants and that because we have so much knowledge within our system and groups that we're working with. Our learning and development, we also want to make sure we're including our front line, doing some collaboration on new hires, uh, making sure we're doing clinical ladders and our communications that are going out to our staff and even including policies and procedures, we wanna make sure we're collaborating on these because many of our providers work at multiple levels of care, whether they're in some of our clinics or whether they're in um, inpatient or you know, uh, doing office work or things like that. We wanna make sure everyone's on the same page. And this really becomes very important as we're bringing in residents and students. So we're giving them a basis of uh, collaboration and having them only have to understand what one policy is and what our best practices are. Obviously, we've been really looking at the research and innovation um, that we have in Western New York. And there are many different avenues of this where we um, really are leaders and we really wanna make sure we're publishing and putting out there our experiences and identifying what best practices are for patients. And some of that we want to, as you see at the bottom of the slide, really look at philanthropy, foundations, grants, to make sure we're growing what we're doing as well as publicizing what we're doing. And then under population health, again, this is not just looking at quality of care for hospitals, but across the continuum of care for our community. So as we're looking at transitions of care, getting the right partners <clears throat> together so our patients 
have everything from pharmacy and medication management to clinic care to care management and have some navigators to help them know how to navigate healthcare and go to the level of care they need. We wanna make sure people are not using emergency departments as their primary care provider, making sure we're hooking up people to have that primary care in the right setting. So again, a lot of population health um, work is being done. And then under contract support, again, pulling together many of the contracts, this includes our physician initiatives, but also the third party payer incentives that are out there, looking at the quality of care we provide and making sure we're working on these together as a group. And then the last column or division is the infection prevention piece being led by myself and Dr. John Selleck. And again, because of COVID, you know, this has been a big initiative, our most current emerging infection, but we're still looking at that zero infection goal and identifying the best practices on infection prevention. So even currently, as we're looking at some of the new guidelines that just came out from OSHA, we're working on these together to make sure that we have a collaborative approach at all levels of healthcare, which include our clinics, our hospitals, our primary care sites, all together working, including our long-term care sites as well, to make sure we have the highest level of infection prevention. Um, you can't control infections, but you can prevent them. And we wanna make sure we have the best practices out there to do that. So with that, I'll go to the next um, slide, please. So as we're establishing the synergy among our network, we have all these different groups working together you know, both from the hospitals to the ambulatory care centers, including GPPC, our Great Lakes Imaging and different groups. And with that, with our integrated network, we still are keeping the patient in the center of everything. And the Quality Institute will provide resources, um, provide guidance, provide research and provide information to every level of care um, provided to our patients. And again, make sure that we're doing this in a collaborative way so that as we develop our Quality Institute, everyone is working together. This is gonna to improve efficiency and also the timeliness of care for patients as we have navigators in different groups identifying where care can be provided in the best level and making sure that the patients um, have people to talk to. We have the ability to communicate with the patients and make sure that you know everyone has the same message for the patients going forward. So I know I went through a lot very quickly. You will be getting a lot more information on this through um, 2021 and 2022 as we're developing this institute. But this is a model that's been used by many um, hospital systems across the country that really helps focus on the patient and makes it much easier for our providers as well as the patients to um, be consistent and give them the best care possible. Does anyone have any questions? I think that's my last slide. Char, Mike Hofford here. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, you mentioned ambulatory and the rest of it. Um, you know, it's one thing for us to be um, collaborating with Kaleida, but are, do we have buy-in from the ambulance companies and, and the others involved? I mean, you know, between Kaleida and us, we're kind of like the two big boys in the room, but I want to make sure that, you know, the littler folks um, are on the same page because a lot of times, you know, they're feeding us the patients and if they're not on the same page, it's tough for us to get up to speed. That's a good question and I agree with you completely, but um, we have, because of this integrated network we're working with, we've been going out together and talking about what our specialties are, where patients should go to get the best level of care. Um, you know, like traumas always come to ECMC. We have our excellence in behavioral health and transplant and different, you know, resources that we provide to the community. And we're making sure that the um, community knows what our best, you know, levels of care. And as we're developing our cancer care program and working, you know, to be, become an accredited cancer care program, things like that are things we're out there letting the community know about so they know where to go. It's awesome. Thanks, Char. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. No and, you know, as, as uh, we've looked at our partnership with Kaleida uh, back in 2019 and really decided uh, to focus on three areas, which was um, IT, uh, which we have been working very closely on to make sure that we um, purchase things together and that we look at offsite um, uh, protections for us. Um, and then uh, purchasing, which we joined 
uh, together uh, around purchasing. So those are pretty easy efficiencies. Uh, there's economies of scale around that. And, and quality was the other. Uh, and we have not only worked together with uh, client and the university around quality initiatives in our organizations, but obviously this is the next level is to really uh, look at the clinical care we deliver, the research, and also the teaching. Um, so, uh, you know, this will be a table at which all of these different entities um, sit at, and um, we're able to look, again, as Charlene said, making sure that we provide care at the right place at the right time uh, for patients. That's awesome, Tom. Thank you. Appreciate it. Really do. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Dr. Jones, are you online? Hi, yes, I am. All right, can you uh, talk a little bit about our uh, hospital-acquired uh, infections? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, everyone. So in the spirit of continuing to uh, put a lot of focus and emphasis on our quality and the care that we provide, uh, we continue to track our healthcare-associated infections, our HAIs, which are the infections, the Klapsicaudi and C. diff as well as um, the patient safety indicators noted at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so we track these on a monthly basis. And I'm happy to say uh, for the month of May, we did not have any CMS uh, caudies or clapses. So that is kudos to the multidisciplinary teams that continue to uh, try to adopt best practices and ensuring that uh, we have staff compliance and that uh, we continue to reinforce what our policies are. So um, we are certainly going in the right direction. We will continue to monitor um, these, as I mentioned, on a monthly basis. And again, kudos to the team. And, and just for uh, new board members, um, these indicators are very important in our quality scores that we get publicly. Uh, so that first one is catheter associated urinary tract infection. The other ones are central line uh, infections. And, um, you know, obviously we have a lot of ICU patients, we have very sick patients. So some of this is case mix adjusted. It's adjusted for the acuity of the patients. Um, but it's, it's obviously in a, in a uh, hospital like ours, it's a very acute population uh, and teaching population. You know, these, 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 um, these numbers are very impressive that we had zero in May. So, uh, we talk about our journey to um, zero harm in institutions, uh, in healthcare institutions. Thank you, John. Lost my battery cover here. Um, in healthcare institutions, and that's our journey that we're on is to really uh, get to zero harm. So, to Tom's point, when the public hears about what our quality ratings are, these are all of the metrics that flow, that flow into those uh, judgments, and that's why they're so important. It also occurs to me that we, uh, if not just for me, then for our new board members, some of the acronyms that we use, yes. we probably should do like a glossary. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> talking about that? I that. You know, the Healthcare Association used to make a book of uh, all the acronyms, that, so we'll have to see if they still have that, have that book. So and highlight it, yes, for me, the ones that yeah. matter. Yeah. 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 That's true. What did you just say? Yeah. And please stop me and ask. Uh, um, just wanted to also keep the uh, board aware we, we have many <laughs> accreditations and surveys in the organization. Uh, it seems like every week is a new survey from the uh, state or a uh, accrediting body, uh, but the American Association of Blood Banks uh, just uh, did their survey here and went, it went very, very, very well. So kudos to the folks in that area. Uh, also, this week is the American Central Hospitals Conference, and uh, we have uh, presentations in that conference. Uh, so Karen will be uh, presenting in there. And I believe also City Bass is uh, doing a presentation also. So it's a national uh, organization uh, of safety net hospitals and we'll be presenting uh, at, that, at that conference. Find safety net hospitals. Uh, well, it depends who you talk to, uh, but we define it uh, as large uh, academic teaching hospitals that um, have a high level of Medicaid 40% or above, I would say. Uh, some may say lower, depending on who you are, uh, if you want to be defined as a safety net hospital. But uh, pretty much um, it started out actually as the Public Hospital Association and then uh, became essential hospitals because some of the public hospitals became private, uh, but still serve the same population. So that's why the name has changed. Do we embrace that? Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Um, the, the next thing is our patient experience. We now call it human experience and, and Donna Brown uh, leads that area for us. Uh, and Donna uh, has been engaging in some initiatives we'll talk about in a second, uh, but we across the country and across the state um, in COVID, uh, all the patient experience numbers went down. Uh, as you can see, the N uh, up top there is about half of what it was before. So about half, you know, a little, little more than half uh, are filling out surveys. And there's been a real significant reduction in the number of people filling out surveys. Uh, and sometimes I think when we get really nice letters, they think that's the survey uh, by doing that. But really, you know, we really have to encourage patients to do that. So on the next slide, we're starting some of our patient experience initiatives up again, if you will, because we haven't been able to gather as an organization. Uh, so Donna, do you want to talk a little bit about some of these initiatives? Sure. Thank you, Tom, and good evening um, to everyone, and I hope everyone is having um, a great day. So as Tom alluded to, um, as we, you know, came through COVID, um, a lot of the organizations around patient experience, we got together and collectively started to look at patient experience from a human experience, kind of expand the terminology a little bit, and um, to look not just as patients, but additionally as um, our caregivers, you know, folks at the front line, individuals at the bedside, and really look at it from the human experience standpoint. And to really bring us back into to focus, we're going back to basics, the things that we were doing prior to COVID that um, really had our scores at, you know, at and above um, some of the benchmarks that um, we'd set as an organization. So mm -hmm. going forward, it's about reset, refocus, and reimagining the human experience in our new existence. And what we mean by new existence is post-COVID, um, how we look at things, um, how we've experienced things up until this point. So to Tom's point, some of the things that we've been doing to, you know, kind of bring um, some stress relief to um, our frontline members is that we have pop up pause of love, which is ongoing. And we do that every Thursday um, from 12 to 2 and 6 to 8. And it's amazing um, the feedback um, that we get when um, our therapy dogs come in and, you know, our um, frontline staff, department managers, everyone throughout the organization has an opportunity just to spend some time um, with our furry friends. So that's something that's gone over really, really well. We're going back to reinstituting uh, um, our monthly hour of power uh, in July, July 21st to be exact from 11 to 12. And something that we're gonna introduce there as we go through the agenda, obviously we'll talk about um, where we are as an organization, um, any you know, regulatory items that need to be presented, but also start to um, bring in some art therapy for our caregivers. So the first one is going to be um, paint and popcorn and give um, you know, the frontline staff an opportunity just to spend some time painting, expressing themselves um, through um, that particular medium. And then going forward, we'll have spoken word, um, music and things along that nature, just to, again, get everyone kind of back in gear in terms of what, you know, what's at the forefront. And then um, another thing that we're bringing back which is something that we were working on in 2019 was um, our Patient Promise Wednesdays. And this was a series of ongoing trainings that we did um, with the staff at the unit level and also, um, you know, just in general throughout the organization. And there's seven components to this particular training that really focuses on, you know, the human experience and what matters most um, to patients and families, as well as the caregivers. So a lot of things, you know, we have on deck um, coming forward, just again, to reset, refocus, and reimagine um, the human experience within our new existence. Back over to you, Tom. All right. Thanks, Tom. Any questions? For You're Donna? welcome. Any questions for anyone? Thank so, you. Thank you, Donna. So I've <laughs> you know, as you know, as an organization, we spend a lot of time thanking our frontline people for what they do, mm -hmm. uh, family. 
Um, they do an unbelievable job each and every day and, and deal with uh, you know some of the most difficult situations with patients. Um, so we are going to keep, obviously haven't been able to do that in the traditional ways we've been doing it, like gathering uh, and having large events. Uh, so we're we're trying to get like, this connectivity back uh, with everybody in the organization. And I think uh, we have we'll talk about it a little bit. We have the picnic coming back. Uh, I think that'll that'll be really good. But we have to be conscious of it. I think burnout and uh, you know the COVID hangover, as people are calling it, uh, is real. <laughs> And uh, I think that uh, we have to pay attention to it as an organization. Like we, we did in the past, we always paid attention to our culture and our, and our East Nancy family, but we need to continue to do it uh, even more vigilant. Uh, so with regard to culture, fast. Okay, it's hard to believe that it's been one year since our uh, key bank trauma and emergency department opened, but it has been. And uh, as we opened it during COVID, uh, so we had a celebration uh, with the folks uh, in the emergency department and uh, treated them all to lunch, uh, which was very, very nice. And thank, thanks to Sue Gonzalez and her team who always do a great job in, in doing that. So there's just some pictures from that, uh, that anniversary. Uh, we, we had our Juneteenth uh, celebration uh, here at ECMC. And as you can see, we, we uh, take advantage of the, the new technology we have in our letters to uh, make sure we do uh, we recognize all eight. Uh, different celebrations and, and events here at ECMC. Uh, we also had a uh, pride uh, parade uh, here at ECMC with our employees and a lot of uh, employees participated as you can see. So uh, we're very uh, proud to be able to do that. Uh, we had, I always like to uh, recognize our frontline staff uh, here at the hospital and also over at Terrace View. Uh, and here's some individuals this month that uh, won the Nurse Hero and Terrace View Employee of the Month and Amanda and Donna. And um, we, we were recently named among one of the top 50 hospitals in the US uh, for racial uh, inclusivity. And um, I'm forgetting right now, uh, Peter, the name of the uh, institute. It is the, the Lone Institute. It's uh, based in Boston, Massachusetts, founded by a, a famous cardiologist, Bernard Lone. And uh, they started this institute several years ago, and they have a, a, a very uh, comprehensive program and index that they utilize to determine uh, institutions' success in a variety of, uh, of disciplines around in, in the hospitals around the around the United States. And this in particular, in this particular instance, it was for racial inclusivity both within the institution and uh, in the re in the area that they serve. And so it's, it's quite a, an achievement. Uh, we were uh, number 34 out of the top 50 uh, hospitals uh, the, in, in the presentation that they made, but they surveyed 4,200 hospitals in the United States. So it was quite, a, a, quite an accomplishment for ECMC. So we're very proud of that. As, as you know, we established um, our uh, equity inclusion office uh, over three years ago. Uh, here at ECMC, who, uh, who, and Cindy Basket, of course, directly in my office. Uh, and she's done some great work in the, in the institution uh, around uh, awareness, <laughs> as well as initiatives to make sure that we're being uh, equitable in our institution. And, uh, and really, I think, you know, from a hiring perspective to uh, training for individuals in our institutions around sensitivity, uh, it's been really, it's been really remarkable. It's and been promotion. Been great work. And yeah. promotion. Okay, correct. Um, we, we're having an employee recognition event uh, actually coming up tomorrow. We have 450 employees who are going to be attending. Uh, and then we have this event every year. We usually have it in person, but we're going to try it virtually. Uh, and it's to recognize years of service. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Uh, we also had our UB uh, coach uh, do a presentation to, uh, to our leadership council. Uh, so we're very happy to have uh, Lisa come into that. And um, she did an outstanding job uh, for it. We've got a lot of positive feedback. Uh, we have our employee picnic. Uh, coming up here, July 14th. Uh, we'll do that for all three shifts. Uh, Jeffrey will be sending around uh, a sign-up sheet if you'd like to participate uh, from the board perspective. Uh, the employees really like seeing you. Uh, we, um, I think, you know, over the years, I've got a lot of positive feedback about uh, board involvement uh, with that. We obviously serve the employees uh, here at ECMC, and, and again, we, we do all three shifts. So uh, if you want to come here at one o'clock in the morning, you're welcome to do that. And uh, again, the employees really, really appreciate that. And it's just nice to be able to do that in person. And I would hope that all of the uh, all of our board members take at least one of the shifts. I know uh, 
uh, Jim Persico and I are going to do the 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. We had so much fun last night. Sounds good. Right, Jen? That's 100% true. <laughs> <laughs> so you you signed up. <laughs> Um, in operations, uh, we Nicholas Long did a presentation um, at the uh, 2021 New York State Regional uh, MWBE meeting. So it was very, uh, we're very proud of our uh, progress and our success here with MWBE at ECMC and making sure we reach above 30%. Uh, percent, uh, and we, we achieve that uh, almost every single quarter. So uh, it's very, you know, the team's just always done a great job. And I know that the committee is going to be uh, meeting again here soon. Uh, we have a new uh, medical director for bariatrics, uh, Dr. Christina Sanders, uh, has just recently been appointed as the medical director. And then finally, uh, our virtual care platform has been launched. So this is a platform uh, that makes it a lot easier for the clinicians and our patients uh, to be able to access our virtual care here. Um, and we're using, we're kind of branding that across the system uh, and really, you know, being proactive about uh, the, the new reality of the virtual world that we live in and the, people, the fact that people are comfortable uh, with virtual care now. Uh, as you know, uh, I know in psychiatry, for example, we had very high compliance on, on uh, visits uh, as compared to in-person visits. Um, so uh, we're, taking, you know, we're taking advantage of the fact that people are now comfortable with that. And I think uh, as time goes on, uh, this connects to our website and how uh, all patients interact with us, uh, not just the website, but throughout the building and throughout many points. And Keith Lukasik's done a really, really good job of uh, leading that initiative and uh, you know, expanding that across the institution. Our, our May statistics. So uh, good news is we're seeing some green on the board. Uh, our discharges, uh, obviously, compared to last year uh, when we were kind of shut down, um, it's 27% uh, uh, higher, but uh, we're off budget just a touch. Uh, our actually behavioral health visits are down a little bit, inpatient visits, which, uh, you know, hopefully people are getting more care in the, in the community. Um, our observation patient observation cases uh, are down. If you remember, um, the, the insurance companies were designating a lot of uh, patients observation. I have a feeling that pressure is going to come back at some point. Uh, but right now, uh, the pressure's kind of come off the observation piece where they basically took our inpatients and, and coded them at a, at a lower rate, uh, make it very simple. Uh, our case mix uh, adjusted discharge uh, number is, is uh, very, very good. Uh, you can see our leg that stays a little higher, and that's because of obviously the COVID patients uh, that we have here uh, and our average length of stay. Uh, inpatient uh, surgeries are down. Uh, a little bit, but our outpatient is, has gone up significantly. And this is a dynamic that's been going on, again, across the community. And because we have been so busy <laughs> uh, in the institution, and I think I mentioned we had our highest census on record in May. Uh, at one point, we had 551 patients in the building one day. Um, with that, <coughs> basically the same amount of discharges we usually have. Uh, it's actually been a relief that our inpatient surgeries are down a little bit because we'd really be in trouble. Uh, if our inpatient surgeries were, were up where they usually are. Um, and then emergency room visits, you can see are up. Uh, admissions uh, through the ED is down a touch, uh, and our outpatient visits are up, but that includes also uh, testing and vaccinations. Any questions with regard to that? How many COVID patients do you have now? 15. 15 in house. Any in ICU? I believe we have four. We have an, 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 in the ICU? Three. 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 So John, yes, Mike Hoffer here. Um, I got a question on the observation cases. Um, yeah, I think because of what we've experienced through COVID, I think the insurance companies are going to push back very hard um, on future observation cases. Uh, you know, they're going to want it done virtually, probably. Um, are we looking into maybe capturing? Um, those observations at home with different technologies, say, you know, whether it's blood pressure monitors or, you know, all the stuff that the iWatch I does today and, and so on and so forth. I kind of think they're going to be pushing in that direction, but we're going to need to, to be on with the, uh, with the technology. So um, to answer your question, I, I think the, it depends if the observation cases are truly observation cases, meaning that's 
I, I think before COVID, a lot of the observation cases were really inpatients uh, and should have been paid as such, but were being pushed in the observation status uh, by the insurance companies. Uh, but to your point, Mike, I think there's a, you know, a, a time when we move from fee for service to value where I think you will see more people at home. I think if people can be observed at home, um, we will be doing that more. Uh, but the way the system is set up presently, and we're, we're talking to all the insurance companies about how we can work with them to move from fee for service to value. Um, and we'll talk more about that in our strategic sessions. But um, yes, the answer, the short answer to your question is yes, we are looking into those technologies. We are doing that, whether they will be appropriate for patients who are here on observation or not, uh, will yet to be seen, uh, depending on how sick those patients really are. Um, but you're going to see a lot more, you know, you're already seeing more home care. Um, and the question will be, can we get the people, <laughs> the workers to uh, do all that work, the home care work? Uh, another right. so, I, because I mean, I just yeah. see it's, the yeah. way the insurance companies are and the way they they try to squeeze every red cent. Um, but you're you're right. You know, there are patients that do need to be seen face to face and and literally hands on um, for observation. And yeah, you know, I just want to make sure that we're prepared um, for the what the insurance companies are going to throw at us. And it sounds like we are. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Yeah, we're going to be working with them to align ourselves, I think, a little bit more moving forward. The other piece is I'm sitting on a committee, the Department of Financial Services Committee, uh, that the governor created to really work with the providers, consumer groups, and the payers to start taking some of the administrative process out of the transaction that goes back and forth between us and the, and the payers. Um, so I, you know, the, the, a lot of the regulations were waived uh, during COVID, and um, I think that you know the world didn't come to an end. Meaning, you know, the payers didn't you know, pay all kinds of money because all these regulations were were relaxed. Um, so I think that's going to some of that's going to continue, which will be good for us. But um, we are always paying attention, right, John? That's a good segue, right, John. John. Every day. <laughs> that's, that's great information, though, Tom. I mean, Thank you, you know, Mike. that is a large expense for us, the administration, and you know, going back and forth on, on different nonsensical things, in my opinion. But uh, I'm glad to hear that I am. Thank you again. Yeah. I have a question. The ages of the COVID patients, where are they? Um, where are the ages? Yeah, I'll let Dr. Murray. Uh, more recently, we have seen a shift to a younger age group. Uh, we're seeing more patients in the kind of 19 to 54 age group. Uh, you know, obviously with the first wave, it was predominantly uh, elderly patients. And that seems to be due to the fact that most of the patients that are being admitted now are patients who have not been vaccinated. That seems to be the pool that's, that's getting infected. But we're down probably to, to one admission, an average of one admission per day. Yeah, we, we saw as, as the numbers were going down, we saw that shift from the older uh, population to kind of middle aged population. How are the employees? Are do you have 100 percent vaccinated at this point? We, eight, we have 87 percent vaccinated, and, and Joe Jillian can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have zero patients with COVID right now or out for COVID. With COVID. We have so, zero employees out for COVID, correct? Right. Go. Um, John, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, so I know Tom uh, touched on most of this slide. I asked Jeffrey to keep it up just for a moment, uh, just to put it in context for the month and how this really impacted it. Um, so as Tom said, we've been extremely busy. Uh, and the inpatient, you, you really expect the inpatient discharges to reflect that high census. And they do, uh, with the exception of the fact that because we had some longer stay patients here, uh, they didn't translate into the discharges really until June. So if you look at our June numbers, uh, we're actually trending above plan even through you know, this, this time during the month. Uh, but what's important is our, our discharges are down about uh, 55, which is about 3%. But within that, our inpatient surgeries, as Tom said, are down six, a little over 6.6%, uh, which does have an impact because that means we're seeing more medical cases, which are typically lower reimbursement cases than we are on the surgical side which typically carry a higher margin. And uh, although we've seen an increase in outpatient cases, 
uh, those typically carry on the surgical side much less revenue per case than an inpatient surgery. So all that kind of translates to lower case severity uh, than we had anticipated uh, and thus lower revenue than our budget. And so when you flip to the next slide, if you could, Jeffra, um, <clears throat> that coupled with, I'll get into some of the details, but that coupled with uh, what we've been seeing the last several months, which is you know a continuation of some increased COVID related costs on the salary side, on the supply side, uh, cleaning, purchase services, um, that along with our normal expense variances that we've been seeing, we have FTE variances that I'll talk about. Uh, we had a, a loss from operations of about two and a half million dollars. We had expected to lose about 330,000. So um, we're, we have a variance, we're behind plan for the month. Uh, and then again, we're behind plan uh, on the year to date basis. And so I'll, I'll talk about year-to-date in a moment, but uh, the other thing I just wanted to highlight here uh, is that our FTEs, uh, as you can see, about a little over 3,483. Um, that trends actually above our plan. We've known that. We've, we've instituted additional hiring on purpose going into the busy season. You'll see that begin to increase as we get further along into the spring. Um, and, you know, trying to accommodate both the current volume and the volume that we do anticipate uh, over the next couple of months, well, really three to four months. Uh, days cash on hand remains strong. Our budget is 70.4. We do anticipate that coming down towards the 70 by year end, as we've talked about. And just, Jen, just to mention year to date very quickly. So um, the quote, the stop the stopping of surgeries costs us about $8 million. So we're actually about $2 million off of the plan if that hadn't happened, if we, if we hadn't had that stopping of surgery. So, um, you know, I think there's a couple things out there. One is the CARES Act funding. There is funding still $8.5 billion designated. Uh, the other funds that haven't been used, there's conversations about using them, there's conversations about sweeping those accounts, so there's all kinds of conversations going on, so as you all know, uh, especially, around the, uh, especially around the infrastructure. Um, but um, we also have our PPP loan, PPP loan uh, forgiveness is still out there. So uh, we do have a couple levers, uh, if you will, but uh, you know, we're continuing to monitor that number because we want to try to get uh, you know, as close to budget, obviously, as possible. John, I know, I know I should know this. What is the total amount of the PPP loan? The total PPP loan was $10 million. It was the maximum allowable. So, Dan, we're making monthly payments on that at this point? Uh, no, we're not, actually. They uh, did not require any payments uh, until the resolution of a forgiveness application. So, uh, right now, we're accruing interest. So, we have the interest being accrued within the income statement, but we haven't made any payments. The, the, I can jump ahead quick, but the, the PPP loan forgiveness application had been filed and the SBA is actually reviewing it at this point. The, the one we are uh, paying back to is this uh, Medicare loan that we got. Okay. Yes, and, and, yeah, and that's, and that's a significant amount of money that we, you know, we're paying back every single month. So. Yeah, hey, I'll talk about that quick on the last slide. But, uh, so this uh, is just a picture of the month. Not going to re review any, you know, all the details I just described, only to say that uh, when you look at this, you can see that um, the outpatient revenue was not enough to offset uh, really the, the full losses of the revenue from the inpatient side. So uh, we still have the expenses to care for all the patients, uh, but the revenue uh, from a budgetary standpoint was well behind. And that differential is really made up of several things, uh, including what I mentioned before, COVID costs, uh, salaries and supplies. But also we're seeing an influx of health insurance claims as we did last month, um, but it's really cyclical. So when you look at that you know, on a year-to-date basis, we're actually still below our healthcare costs. Is there any impact yet on Highmark? I mean, have they assumed any role yet? They've, no, they've, no, they've assumed a role, but they, there hasn't been any significant impact. And no changes in policy or the reimbursement rates? Uh, some of the changes in policies actually have been beneficial okay. uh, recently that we've worked with them on. So, uh, next slide. And, and as Tom said, so when you look at year to date, 
and you look at an $18.4 million operating loss uh, compared to the $8 million that we had budgeted, there's a $10 million variance, uh, eight of which really did occur in the first two months of the year. And so to Tom's point, we're about $2 million behind plan absent the first two months performance because of the restrictions. Uh, so we are monitoring that closely. It's not unexpected. Um, you know, we would expect to be behind plan just given some of the additional uh, costs that we've seen, plus uh, the shifts in inpatient to outpatient that we've seen. Uh, next slide. So as I do every month, um, just keeping us abreast of our COVID impact. So uh, this for the new board members is uh, a simple tracking mechanism to show how much the COVID pandemic has really impacted DCMC, uh, both in lost revenue and expense. And you can see here through May, uh, just for this year, it's about a $12.7 million impact. And when added to what we had tracked for last year, just close to 97 million, it brings us to about 110 million of uh, COVID impact, both lost revenue again and expense since the beginning of the pandemic, not even including two uh, larger items. One, uh, the pension expense that we had incurred last year, which was about 37 million, that was really COVID driven. Uh, and then the additional project delay costs that are coming as it relates to, um, you know, push the building project uh, because of COVID. Questions on that before I last? John, could you touch base on the pension uh, cost from last year that was COVID driven? Yeah, so I, uh, sorry, Ben. Um, so last year, so part of our, uh, well, a large component of our employee base still participate in the New York State Retirement Plan, uh, which has a valuation date for, an actuarial evaluation date for their plan of March 31st. March 31st last year was the trough in the market and uh, as well as interest rates. And so, uh, when their plan was valued and that those actuarial changes were pushed back to all the participants, uh, last year's impact for us was an additional expense of $37 million uh, on top of what our normal cost would have been, which was $37 million. So essentially doubled our expense um, by just really being driven by the timing of the pandemic and the timing of the market falling out. So this year we would expect that, and well, the rates are still low, but markets obviously doing better. Yeah, this year, I mean, we are seeing significant turn in the markets uh, from last year. Um, the impact of which we just don't know yet, given the fact that we just don't know the rates. Um, okay, and then the next slide, uh, just a couple of updates. I won't take too much time, but Tom mentioned, the Federal CARES Act relief or any other federal funding, about $25 billion of undistributed monies uh, that, that remain from previously approved uh, tranches of the CARES Act and the, and the uh, Rescue Act. Uh, those dollars have not been distributed. They're not, uh, there's been no plan put forward to distribute them. There's been no applications uh, and no methodology shared yet. We are expecting that that may come soon. Uh, what they have done is, is said that they, uh, the secretary has said that they do intend to be transparent about the distribution. They do realize that in, the, in past distributions, hospitals like safety net hospitals have been uh, overlooked. And so there are some good indicators there, but we just don't know yet as to where or when or how much uh, we may we may get. Yeah, I was there's, just, there's a lot of pressure on to get some money here. There is, yeah. and you know, I, I've been trying to, not get in my soapbox too much, but um, we, I was just at an AEH board meeting yesterday. And it's almost like a tale of two cities, though, a little bit. Some institutions like ours, and frankly, Collider, the Catholics also, you know, we stopped surgeries where we didn't get reimbursed as much as our expenses were uh, or our lost revenue. Um, some hospitals didn't do that across the country. So some hospitals actually are having a hard time spending their money. Uh, or they were just packed with patients and COVID and everything else, like New York City, for example. So, um, so it's it's a it's and so what's happening is the federal government's hearing that some hospitals are okay, and so it's confusing them a little bit on, on the situation because some hospitals frankly are flush. 
Uh, some, some of the hospitals have to pay the money back. Some hospitals have to pay some of the money back they got because they couldn't spend it. So it's just a, you know, and, and so they need to figure out a way for the ones like us who, you know, we run the front lines, right? We're, you know, and, and everybody talks about uh, everybody being on the front lines just because the dollars we get get reinvested into facilities and people, right? Into our nurses and our, and our uh, staff here at ECMC family. So, you know, I've been, we can continue to talk about that and, uh, you know, there's others that are out there, you know, beating that drum. So we'll have to see what, what ends up happening. But um, it, it's also just worrisome that they keep talking about sweeping the rest of the care that so that would be bad. Is there, is, how do we interact with the federal government? Is there a way to lobby for the money? At a, at yeah, so we have a um, healthcare association in New York State. We're uh, on the board of that. And also American Central Hospitals, which is strictly focused on safety of that hospitals. Uh, we also interact with AHA, uh, American Hospital Association. So those are the kind of the big uh, organizations that are pushing for more funding and, and pushing for hospitals to be included in the infrastructure bill and all those types of things. Um, and, you know, we've had uh, actual meetings. Peter Cutler had set up actual meetings with each of the offices, uh, federal offices, to talk to them about uh, some of the struggles that we're having. So we've met with Schumer staff, we've met with Jill Brennan staff, we've met with Higgins staff. Uh, and you know, I, I mentioned something to you know, Congressman Higgins directly about this, and um, so it, it's just it, there's a lot of people, talk, yeah. you know, pushing on it. It's yeah. just a matter. Of, you know, They're only hearing the good news. Though. They only hear the news that the hospitals are flush. Getting the word in that not all hospitals are flush is a problem, right? So and I mean, so people are, you know, getting vocal. I mean, I had a, we had an article in the Wall Street Journal where uh, we were you know, quoted in that. Um, Business first, just did our thing a little bit. So there, there's noise out there. It's I, you know, I think it's just the, you know, the inertia <laughs> that's going on right now is a problem. So, yeah. so it's, a, it's a double pronged strategy, Christian. They, I think there's the, 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 the overall or the, or the one driving it has been that there's a national push to care of healthcare as a result of COVID, and that's why you know, Tom's role in some of these these organizations is so critical. When it comes down to ECMC individually, you can talk all we want to Higgins and Jacobs and the governor and everybody else, but we're one one in a queue of hospitals talking about the same thing. So we're, we're trying to do both. Is, is probably the answer. But the Tom's role nationally and, and statewide is critical. Get ECMC you know, at least in the, the first part of that conversation. We touched on uh, most of the other items on this update. Just the only thing to Sharon's question before. So we've paid back about $4.2 million of the $37 million Medicare loan that we had taken out that was available to us through the CARES Act. Um, that will be paid back for the next 18 months. Um, and so it's a steady stream of payments, every remittance from Medicare that we begin to pay back. And that's why you'll see uh, on a regular basis, the day's cash on hand uh, slowly pull back to what we would budget, what we had budgeted for, and what we would consider in our kind of what our run rate was in our normal cash. Flow. To answer any questions that anyone has, questions for John before we we move on. Just be, before before we we, uh, we leave the subject, John, would you just talk briefly about the budget process and the timeline? Sure. For uh, yeah, so we've, uh, we as, as uh, ECMC and, and following along in the public authority uh, timeline, we uh, start our budget process and we've started it already internally uh, and go through a process where we'll, we'll finish by uh, early to mid September uh, and then bring that process, uh, the results of that through to the board, finance committee and board uh, in September with a published date for us of September 30th. Uh, throughout that process, obviously, it's, you know, there's a lot of internal uh, workings that go on and a lot of uh, discussions, but we, we like to, uh, this year especially, kind of work from the ground up because it's so uh, challenging to set a baseline, because last year was just all over the map, uh, and 2019 is somewhat stale when you think about what happened in between then and now, and what we're seeing in some of the trends. So uh, we're really, you know, trying to stay true to the process uh, while adjusting it so ever so slightly to make sure that we're addressing what's actually happening. 
Did I answer your question? Anything else? Good. Thank you. No more questions. Okay, just real real quickly, uh, some uh, FYIs going forward. Uh, the uh, and the first is a recognition and congratulations to to Dr. Murray and Dr. Cummings and to Dr. Brown. You know, as we begin to come out of this, whew, this COVID, as Tom refers to it, this this uh, you know, COVID fatigue. You know, I think it, it is without declaring victory just yet. The, the elements of our clinical care have continued to be at spectacular levels. We continue to see improvements all across the board, as you saw today, relative to our patient experience and our and our quality metrics. So the fact that that, that, that the clinical side of the you know, of our hospital you know continues to just do spectacular work. We were just talking to to, uh, uh, to Dr. Taylor. For example, you know, who's, who's on track now to do a record number of transplants uh, at the end of the year? So, so things like that are are continuing to be just uh, you know, functioning that uh, in a way and at a level that I think the board should not only be aware of but proud of. Uh, one of the things that Tom and I continue to talk about is the impact on all of this relative to our culture. And I would suggest to you that you know, as, as we come out of this, the thing you know, that, 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 that I most hear about in my day-to-day -day travels is, is the culture about what happens here and how people are treated. So I think one of the things that we're gonna ask the board to do is really begin to, to think about not only how we take that next step into telling everybody how much we appreciate what they've done and recognize the continuing work that they've done, uh, but also, recognize what, what what the efforts have been in in ways that COVID has caused you know, once in a lifetime implications. And uh, I think two of those things are things that we want to uh, at least pay attention to. The you know, one is Spring Fest. Um, uh, we, we've, uh, we're still going strong now. I think we are virtually sold out, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right? well, you know, almost for the, for the fall. We've hired uh, Andy Davis' favorite uh, favorite band and Rogue, um, so they're under contract and will will be here. And uh, it's important that we have a great uh, turnout from the board at that event. Tom mentioned um, July 14th. The uh, and it's not just about you know our showing up, but it is about the hospital staff seeing the members of the board whether it be one to three in the afternoon or one to three in the middle of the night, uh, because the hospital runs 24 seven. And there are people that have worked for 20 years in those, what we sometimes think are the crazy shifts, but stuff that they do all the time. So I would hope that you all take that seriously and sign up for one, if not two or all of them. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, I, I will tell you, you know, again, I've, you've done it. I know some of you around this table have done it as well. It's actually fun. But what it does do in, in, in a way that is both meaningful and realistic, you know, tell the, the hospital staff, uh, doctors and nurses and, and support staff and security folks and, and building operations folks that we not only we care, but that we appreciate it done. So if you're not, if you're not out of town uh, and available, it is something certainly that I would ask you to very seriously consider. And, and uh, I don't know, Jeff, we're gonna have everybody sign up for it. Call Sue or, or maybe both. We'll send a schedule. Yeah, we'll send a schedule. Right? Yeah, okay. we'll send a schedule. Let's, uh, you know, let's, uh, let, let, let's do that. Um, one of the other things that, that you should be aware of, and, and thank you for those of you who have participated, there is a seminal moment on the, uh, in the medical community uh, that we're in the middle of, and that is the search uh, for a new dean and vice president of health sciences at the University of Buffalo. Uh, that role uh, is, uh, is, is critical not only to us, uh, but uh, but to the community and to the greater Western New York uh, community. So we uh, you know, we're going to be vigilant about at least exerting whatever influence we can as that search continues. Uh, and uh, you know one of our one of our great friends and and uh, and supporters Nancy Nielsen is chairing the search. Uh, Nancy, as you might know, Dr. Nielsen uh, is a former president of the American Medical Association. So I've got great, uh, I've had a number of conversations with her, and uh, I, I think she and, and President Tripathi are both committed to bringing world-class dean of the medical school, and conversely, uh, uh, 
vice president of health sciences uh, to the university, which has huge impact for what we do here on a daily basis, not only with our clinical staff, but certainly in, in terms of all the medical medical education that we do. Um, so, so please uh, be aware of that. And, and the, the last thing I would suggest to you is has to come out of this COVID, uh, this COVID fatigue. Uh, <laughs> Reverend Lou and, 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 and Christian and, and I, uh, with along with Tom and Peter, uh, did a tour earlier this afternoon. And quite frankly, it's been 16 months or more since I had been on that tour, which while we were doing the capital campaign, we had done, you know, it seemed like every, every other day. Uh, and it struck me once again that, and Jeffrey, we should probably do this as well, to invite all of our board members again to, to, to reconnect with our clinical staff and, and just see not only what, you know, what, you know, what our family is doing, but almost more importantly, how they've come through COVID. And, and you know, there's some changes in the hospital, which I was not aware of, you know, that, that it comes as a result of having dealt with COVID for the past 16 months, that I think uh, not only you would be very proud of, but important that you understand. And that is, um, the, uh, you know, Thomas talked about the, the, the emergency room and the, and the trauma unit, which was full today. Uh, when we walk through, uh, and whether it be the burn unit or transplant or or or, or uh, uh, orthopedics, uh, we really should uh, make a point of, of having everybody to the degree that uh, we can do that. And I think I don't think it's a little over an hour. Mm -hmm. It's not a big lift. It really isn't. So if, if anyone is interested in doing that, I would ask you to uh, to consider that. So. Uh, that's my two cents. Uh, Darby, anything else on, um, on finance? I know Mike is not in the meeting. So, you know, we got some challenges, right, coming up, and, and uh, I think it will be up to the task. But one of the things that, 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 that John and his staff have been able to do is, is figure out what the impact of COVID has been on our operation. You know, up until that point, and it's important that we remember this, we were one of the few hospitals certainly in New York State, if not in the country, that was actually breaking even. And then life kicked in and we're a hundred million bucks in the South. And while I have the confidence that we're gonna be able to deal with that, you know, it's a hundred million bucks. It's, it's a lot of dough by any stretch of the imagination. So it, that, that, that effort is gonna be in all hands on deck with you, but the, um, you know, I have every confidence that we've been able to, to address that, if not in, if not in one year, then <laughs> I, I love your, I'm waiting, your for you to, I'm waiting for you to correct it. <laughs> if not in one year, then in, uh, in, in subsequent years. So, <laughs> <laughs> is there any is there any plans for another capital campaign in the future? Funny you should say that. As <laughs> <laughs> <what> you talk. <laughs> so that's another conversation that, that Tom and I have been having. My answer is yes. <laughs> His answer is uh, the answer is yes. Way, yeah, and, and, and Andy is, is all over it. <laughs> we've, had some, we've had some foundation board members say, can we just have a little breather? <laughs> so we definitely want to do that. I think there's some, you know, and, and we're talking about this in our strategic uh, conversations, but there, you know, there's some things here that I think strategically we need to do. And the other piece about it, as we discussed when we were on the tour, is that you know, people in the foundation board will tell you don't stop asking. You know, so and we, we just recently got the award for the IOP from major foundations that was a billion dollars. Um, but um, that, that is true, like you have to kind of be front, you know, front and center for donors and, and yeah. foundations. And so if your question is yes, it's just what right? you know, he'd do it, he'd do it yes, tomorrow. <laughs> because there's a need. I mean, right. and, and Andy, right, when we speak to while we're at it, please take 30 seconds to talk about the OR and what we're at least thinking. Oh, well, um, as you saw the volumes um, for the OR, we continue to recruit new docs and we continue to be a quaternary and tertiary facility, which means we have higher level services. So there's robots that uh, we need to purchase. We're only going to say we hospitals that, don't have a ro that doesn't have a robot in the community. Um, our OR is um, within the tower about 16. Um, there are a couple of rooms that are probably antiquated that we have to look at expanding. 
And, um, and that's just to take care of the issue volume that we have now. So our doctors are clamoring for two, four uh, additional uh, OR rooms. We actually have a, a third party that's gonna help us go through the process to make sure we can try to make the OR as efficient as possible, but also look at what type of expansion that we need. So ultimately we have to address that situation um, to, to accommodate our surgeon and accommodate growth as we continue to move forward. So I think, um, you know, it's certainly the topic on the table that we we'll have to, to, to tackle, but um, the OR is, is, is one that's showing a, a little age to it and we'd like to make it as comparable as we have the ER, the lobby, and other places in the building. And, and that would be probably the, the, the focus of the capital campaign. Yeah. Okay. That we can start. You're just trying to lead that in, right? <laughs> 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 yes, my friend. So anyway, um, so yes, it's, it's uh, as soon as Tom lets us go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mr. Bennett on building and grounds. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we had a very short meeting today. Um, if your work continues in zone four in the windows, you can tell by the big crane outside and things are moving along well, together with uh, some roof repair that's going to have a watertight before the winter. Then they'll move on to zones three, two, and one. It's pretty well coordinated. Uh, and the other thing is that of interest, the kitchen tray line. Um, I didn't understand it, but now they tell me this is where the food is prepared for the residents the, uh, of the hospital. And um, they're going to have two tray lines as they're putting together. Uh, the bids will be in by July 1st. And it uh, helps to uh, accommodate more people, keep the food warm and the, the cold when it should be. So. It moves on. Uh, obviously, it's a little bit uh, not as much as we did before, but they're doing a great job. And that's the report from Buildings and Grounds. Questions? Thank you, Ron. Thank you. You know that with Ron giving me that opening, what is the story on the trail? Uh, it's out for bid, and uh, we'll award a bid. Pretty soon here in the middle of July, start construction. And when will it be functional? Uh, fall of 2021. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, um, if you continue like, to play for a good no, weather. No, I'm, I'm going to hold my fire. <laughs> no, I was going to say continue to play with good weather because it makes the price of the food. In the presence of the food board, that for me is a promise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Always has been. <laughs> QI, Mike. I regret uh, I don't have a report this month, John. We had to uh, we had to cancel our meeting, so uh, next month I'll have twice as much. Thanks, John. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mike. So, is there anything else that you want to uh, talk about? So, unless there's anything for the good of the order, um, new and or old business, I hope you all go out and vote today if you haven't already. Polls are open till nine, and um, I'll resist from doing any other political statement. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, where the hospital is. So um, it's good to see everybody. It's good to be here. Nice nice yeah. yeah. So thank you all very much. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second chair and answer. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.